All right, so good news. It's the beginning of the second half of Social 10. So the end is near. I guess I should have this over here. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the second half of Social 10 has more legs than the first half, meaning I'm going to make a lot of references to these next chapters when we see each other again in grade 12. So I do expect you to keep your notes and to keep an understanding of some of these concepts. So in grade 12, we study liberalism, which economically translates to capitalism. Here in grade 10, we're studying globalization, which economically really translates to capitalism. So in grade 12, when we're looking at capitalism, and we're trying to find some case studies that shows to what extent has capitalism benefited the global village and to what extent has capitalism hurt the global village, we often relate back to case studies from this course. So there's going to be lots of evidence in this next unit. And really related issues three and four of the textbook, it's really just one unit. And this unit is contemporary globalization. So we studied ancient globalization, we studied historic globalization, and now this is contemporary globalization. So in your notes, I would write down the title Contemporary Globalization, because this is a brand new unit. So this will help you so that next time we have a multiple choice test, the midterm, the next midterm, before the final, will be about the content from here until the end of the course. And then the final exam will be obviously the entire course. So contemporary globalization really begins in 1944 at Bretton Woods. But we need to understand how do we get there? We can't just study Bretton Woods in isolation and say, hey, 1944, contemporary globalization begins. Much like we didn't study historic globalization and say in 1492, Columbus made his way to the Americas. We needed some context. So, just like that. So, we're here to provide you some context. So the first lesson of this second unit is about how do we get to contemporary globalization. And in order to answer that, we're looking at chapter 9 of the textbook. And specifically, I had you look at pages 218 to 223. And one of the terms I'd like you to leave here with today is the term paradigm shift. We've talked about paradigm shift before. And I really like to think about basketball um, and the V cut. So in basketball, you're going in one direction and then you cut back, right? It's a V cut. It's like the letter V. And it's like my only offensive move I have. So if you ever play basketball against me, just look for the V cut. So a V cut's paradigm shift. You're going in one direction and then you're like, no, we need to switch. We're gonna go back in a different direction. So, by Bretton Woods, the major powers of the world create a V-cut. They go from competition to cooperation. That's their V-cut. They go from zero-sum theory to working together. So zero-sum theory, as you know, the British thought in order to be strong, they had to isolate and marginalize the French. They can't work with the French because if the French get stronger, then the British get weaker because of it. So what is the paradigm shift in the 20th century? It's the idea that the British and French realize, you know what, we need to work together. That my strength is actually dependent upon your strength, not your weakness, not your relative weakness. So we've spent a lot of time talking about survival of the fittest and social Darwinism and the idea that the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. Well, in this 20th century, in this first bit, some of the major powers of the world recognize that in order for them to remain strong, they have to actually unite with the other strong, not feed on them, but unite with them, work with them. So, pages 218 up to 223, the textbook has a lot of history in it, a lot of history. You know, they cover the causes of World War I, they cover World War I, 
They cover the rise of Stalinism and communism. They talk about the Great Depression. They talk about World War II. For those of you that have been just waiting in social studies for history, and then you get to a chapter like this where there's so much history that they could have unpacked and they didn't, well, we finally have a course for you next year in that social 20. It's history. It begins with you know, the causes of the French Revolution and studies history from then until now. So that'll be a history-based course. You get lots of history next year. And that's why we'll have lots of multiple choice for you because there's lots of building blocks to make multiple choice around. But here we have a chapter that has a lot of history in it, but they don't go into depth about the history. Because the history's there, the evidence is there, much like writing an essay. The evidence is there not to give you a report about history, but to help you formulate some ideas. And the idea here is about this paradigm shift. How do the major countries of the world move away from zero-sum competition to, hey, let's work together? So starting on page 219, it talks about World War I. And it talks about things like the cost of World War I. And it says that for Canada, you can measure the cost by saying we lost 66,000 soldiers. Another way to measure World War I is to say that globally, we lose 15 million soldiers. So Canada loses 66,000 soldiers in World War I. The world loses 15 million. Within that piece of evidence, you should see a reason why competition doesn't work. Because what was World War I? World War I was the product of zero-sum international relations, right? Zero-sum philosophy. That in order for me to get stronger, I must feed on the weak. Well, sometimes when you feed on the weak, they fight back. Or sometimes when the strong are going around the world feeding on weak, then the strong start fighting each other. So World War I naturally happened because of zero-sum international relations. It created war, it created conflict. But the cost of the war was so much that war was no longer a viable piece of foreign policy. The cost of the war meant that war was no longer a viable piece of foreign policy. So why do we have a paradigm shift? Why do we have a V-cut? Because the cost of the war made war no longer viable. So if I was making an argument here, because even though I said I don't want to talk about essays anymore, I'm going to keep talking about them. If I was making an argument, and my argument at the top of my paragraph might be the cost of World War I showed that zero-sum foreign relations was no longer viable, and therefore a paradigm shift was needed. The cost of the war meant that, that you know, zero-sum competition is no longer viable. And what's the evidence there? Well, for Canada, the evidence is 66 million dead soldiers. That's the evidence to prove my argument, that World War I came at a great cost. 66,000 dead Canadian soldiers. 15 dead global soldiers. And maybe as many dead civilians. So those numbers are quite, quite alarming in the sense that how, how can we talk about 66 million dead Canadians? Well, 9-11 happened obviously before you're born, but it really defined these first 20 years of the 21st century. The United States lost just under 3,000 citizens on September the 11th, just under 3,000. And it changed a decade or maybe even the next two decades to come. In this war, Canada lost 66,000. They lost 3,000 and it changed the world. We lost 66,000 in this one war. In World War I, Newfoundland was still a colony of Great Britain. And there's a battle called the Battle of the Somme. And at the Battle of the Somme, every Newfoundland family lost someone. Every family. So right now in Canada, we're concerned about COVID-19. 
and it has changed our reality. It has created a paradigm shift, the way we relate to each other. And we can all be quite thankful that each family hasn't lost someone yet, and probably won't. Every Newfoundland family lost somebody in one battle, the Battle of the Somme. Every Newfoundland family lost somebody. Canada lost 66,000 soldiers in World War I. Canada's lost less than 10,000 people, COVID-19. And now Canada is a nation of 38 million people. Canada was not a nation of 38 million when we lost 66,000. Canada had less than 10 million. So relatively, these numbers were quite alarming. That it was safe to say, it's safe to say that we would lose more people before breakfast in some of these battles than, than we've lost to COVID-19 in Canada. And look how much we've changed Canada because of COVID-19. So why do we need a paradigm shift? Because the casualties made war no longer viable. War is no longer viable. Zero sum competition is not viable because war is not viable. War is not viable because of the number of people dying. So zero sum competition leads to war because not everybody wants to be fed upon and the strong end up competing against each other because there's finite resources. In a world of finite resources, eventually the strong turn on each other and there's war. War is not viable though because of the Industrial Revolution. You know, it's, it's 1914. It's not, it's not 414. In 414, there's war. But you could be a Roman, and if you weren't part of the Praetorian Guard, you're mostly isolated from the conflict. But because of the modernization and mechanization of warfare, war came to civilians in World War I. And, and the soldiers that were part of the meat grinder that was World War I, um, they had a different experience. And you'll get more into history next year. Social 20 is quite a fascinating course. But I want you to just think about how the number of casualties in World War I meant that war is no longer viable, which means that zero-sum competition is not viable, which means we need a paradigm shift. We need to work together. The strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. Now the strong are saying, wait a minute, the strong here are suffering. You know, Canada loses 66,000 soldiers, but Canada in World War I um, ended up losing significantly less soldiers than many of the other so-called strong nations of the world. So if you look at the other strong nations of the world, you'll see that there's countries like Russia who had, up to that point, never lost a land battle that had in excess of a million casualties. I'm going to just try to type and teach at the same time. I'm not going to spell stuff right. <laughs> so, 40 million globally when you combine the um, soldiers and the civilians. So, both the, both the population of Canada today was, was destroyed in the one war. Uh, you can see here that the United Kingdom suffers 744,000, that the French suffer 1.15 million. The United States, they joined the war late, they suffer 53,000. Russians suffer nearly 2 million dead. The Germans suffer 1.8 million casualties. Uh, sorry, this isn't even just casualties. These are deaths, right? So, combined with the casualties, or sorry, the deaths would be people that come back from the war and, and they're broken people. They have shell shock. They have missing limbs. That this number, the, the war dead, is, is not the entire story. That there's other physical and psychological casualties coming from World War I that made leaders of countries say, wait a minute, Maybe we can't just play zero-sum competition with each other. That the cost of war has made war no longer viable. So one way to measure the cost of the war is to look at the amount of soldiers. 
Another way to look at the cost of World War I and say because of the cost of World War I, zero-sum competition was no longer viable, another piece of evidence here is the financial cost. So you can't put a number to a life. You know, how much is one life worth? So we can never really give you a full number because we can't attach any dollar value to the lost lives of these people. But we can attach dollar values to the cities, towns, farms, roads, factories, ports, ships, railways that are destroyed. And one way to measure that dollar value is to look at the amount of money that the Allies had to borrow from the United States to keep fighting, and that was $7 billion. $7 billion might not seem like a lot. I mean, this is with Tascom. We're all rolling in money, right? But uh, $7 billion is significantly more because the economy of the world was a lot less then. So we can also go to Google, just do some quick little research and say, okay, what, what would seven billion in 1918 be worth today? So the value of 1918 dollars today, do do do. So let's go seven billion thousand seventy thousand seven hundred thousand seven million seventy million seven hundred seven billion. Anybody wanna? Anybody wanna guess? Anybody wanna guess? It's Halloween come. <laughs> right? Don't you have to try out some freaky voices? <laughs> no, no. Ah. All right, let's guess. That's a lot of money. So I guess thousand, that's a million. So one hundred and twenty point six billion dollars today. And, and that's just one way to measure, right? That's that's money spent on the war. And you might be saying, well, wait a minute, Justin Trudeau has spent more combating COVID nineteen than the nations of the world spent on World War One. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make this number less alarming. What we need to also consider is that the global economy today, the world economy produces about $60 trillion of wealth every, every year, right? The world economy was not producing 60 trillion a year in 1918. It wasn't even producing a trillion in 1918. So this is uh, due to inflation, but it's still not relative to the size of the global economy. When you include that, this number becomes uh, very unthinkable. So, we needed a paradigm shift because of the cost of World War I. The financial cost, the man cost, the psychological cost. Flipping the page, then we can look at page 220. You can look at the Russian Revolution. So, Russian Revolution, page 220. Why would Russian Revolution cause a paradigm shift? Well, let's say that the gentlemen in this classroom, all, and, and I'm not promoting this at all. I'm not promoting this activity. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's an example so that maybe they'll wake up because sleeping's a thing because you parents at home let them stay up all night. This is on you. So anywho, um, back, back to the point though. Let's say that there's a fight club that existed among the, the boys, and you know what, girls too. I've seen some girls fight, you guys can go. But uh, let's say that there's a fight club that exists among the people in this class. But you're all relatively about the same. So on any given day, any one of you may win. And there's kind of a, a limit as to how bad things can get. And then, new student walks in from like Louisiana or something. 6'9", 295, walks in. Things have changed. The student is the USSR. You guys are like England and France and these countries that have been competing against each other, but now there's a new threat. That's a threat to each one of you. So the significance here is that the strong and each one of you were the strong before, you recognize the fact that, holy crap, we might become the weak. Like, this new superpower that's emerging is a big enough threat to all of us that we may become the weak. 
they may do to us like we did to Africa and the Americas. And, and we, we can't allow that to happen. I'm England. I don't want to be beat up. So what happens is England and, and France, they hate each other. The modern day game of football, soccer, was invented by the English kicking the French skulls around after the battle. That's how the game came. If you don't believe me that the French and the English hate each other, go to France and, and make the sign of like a bow. They don't like that because hundreds of thousands of Frenchmen were killed by English bowmen, right? English longbowmen. English and French still don't love each other today. But in the 1920s and the 1930s, and definitely by the 1950s, they recognized that there was a new threat. And that was the Soviet Union. That was so big of a threat, maybe we need to work together. So why do we get a paradigm shift? What's the catalyst? A catalyst is something that sparks a change, right? A catalyst sparks something. What's the catalyst of a paradigm shift here? Is the strong realizing that they have a common threat. And if they don't deal with the common threat, they will end up losing. And they'll become the weak. And the only way that they can deal with it is to work together. So the only way that you guys can defeat this 6'8", 295 pound student from Louisiana is for you guys to, to attack that person together or at least show them that an attack on one will be an attack on all. That's NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So Luxembourg, very small country. Luxembourg would be easy to take over, but Luxembourg's a part of NATO, and they're part of this umbrella of security. An attack on one is an attack on all. And it's that kind of paradigm shift that was a result of new global threats. So the Russian Revolution and the stories coming out of the Soviet Union about Stalin committing a genocide against his own people, starving six million people to death, that was alarming to the rest of the world. And they said, we can't allow this ideological poison infect our country. How can we defend ourselves against this ideology though? How can we stop such a growing menace that is the red beast? Well, we have to work with our historical enemies. That maybe the British and French have to work together. And that's not even talking about Nazi Germany. Because the Nazis can't, kind of came out of nowhere. But looking at page 230, or 223, another case study that forces a paradigm shift away from competition towards cooperation would be the Nazi Germans. How imposing or threatening were the Nazi Germans? That Louisiana guy, he needed our help to save him from this other guy that came in. The seven foot six undertaker kind of guy. So because... Because the Nazi Germans were a threat even to that big guy from Louisiana, that big guy from Louisiana had to work with us. Cooperation. We had to cooperate with somebody that ideologically we didn't agree with. Ideologically, we're like, you know what, I don't like the things you've been saying. You know, worldwide revolution, you know, workers of the world unite. But we sure hate that Nazi guy a lot more. Let's work together, beat him up, and then we can figure out our stuff. Our issues are secondary to surviving him. Is he, he could destroy all of us. So in the first half of the 20th century, these things rose up that forced a paradigm shift. The threat of Nazism, the threat of communism, the, the casualties of war, all made the need for cooperation more important than competition. Even on page 222, they talk about the Great Depression. And the Great Depression will be a case study that we study in grade, in grade 12 in, in some detail. And it is a very important case study considering the events of the world today. But even in a nation like the United States built on rugged individualism, within that nation, the Great Depression forced them to cooperate. The United States is founded on capitalism. Jamestown was founded on capitalism. But the United States, in order to survive the Great Depression, had a paradigm shift away from rugged individualism, away from freedom from government to freedom through government. So we see even at a state level, a paradigm shift 
because of the events of the first half of the 20th century. Because of the economic suffering of the Great Depression, Americans suddenly became um, aware of their need to invite government into their economic lives because of the amount of suffering in the Great Depression. And we look at the world today, and now we're very comfortable inviting the government into our economic lives. In fact, we expect the government to come to our aid when we're in trouble. That's a legacy of the Great Depression, a legacy of this paradigm shift. So the purpose of this introduction was to look at how do we get to a different globalization? So the contemporary globalization will begin on page 226 with Bretton Woods. But how do we get to a time where the British and the French, and eventually the Germans and the Americans, and the Russians and the Chinese and the Japanese, they all sit down and they cooperate? Doesn't make sense, because we've been studying all this competition. And what ends up forcing these countries to unite and create the United Nations would be those things. The idea that war is no longer winnable, it's no longer viable. The end of World War II, think about it. The end of World War II, atomic bombs can kill tens of thousands of people with one bomb. And by the 1960s, we have bombs that are thousands of times more destructive than those bombs dropped in 1945. We have city-destroying, maybe earth-shattering bombs at the ready of the superpowers. That forces them to see war is not viable. We have something called mutual assured destruction, or MAD. Because of it, we have to rethink foreign relations. We can't just, oh, I don't like that guy, let's go to war. In 1914, people celebrated the beginning of the war. There wasn't a lot of celebrating in the trenches as rats were feeding on people. So our mindset changed because our reality changed. So, due to the economic struggling of the Great Depression, and due to the fear of fascism and communism, due to the casualties of World War I, the great countries of the world had to figure out that they could no longer compete in a, in a zero-sum competition. The entire world was basically a big risk map to them. And most of the world leaders that caused World War I, they were even family members. They were the grandsons and granddaughters of Queen Victoria. So they had to rethink their, their very dangerous competition, and they needed to cooperate. And that's the purpose of the first half of this chapter. The second half of this chapter, we're going to look at after the lunch break. And I'm going to get you to do a little bit of textbook stuff when you get back. Beginning on page 226, I'm going to get you to tell me what Bretton Woods is. Then I'm going to get you to tell me what does the World Bank and IMF do. And they're also outlined on page 228. There's a nice Venn diagram. Then I'll get you to add what does the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, do. And that's basically the chapter. There's some great stuff in there about Milton Friedman and the rise of China, but uh, we'll circle back to China in the future. Um, so that, that's it. That's the foundation of this next unit. I'm going to stop the video, and then we'll give you a chance to absorb what you just listened to, and then we'll get ready for the second half of chapter 9 after lunch.